Oh yes, so let's have a little discussion about <laughs> something. I have a course called Heal the Superego. Let's talk about the superego for a second. Um, the superego, people think, oh you have an ego, and then you have a super ego. It's like Superman flying in the sky. But um, it's a Freudian concept, and it's uh, from his rather archaic use of German, where super would mean above or superseding. So above the ego, not necessarily geographically, like there's an ego and then a super ego floating above, but it might be useful to think of it that way. It's not a geographical assertion, it's a power assertion. So the super ego is the part of the ego, which you already know what that is, your persona, your personality, that which is the boundary between yourself and other people, your, your, yourself, your subjective self, and what we presume to be objective reality. And then what's guiding that is the superego. How does it guide it? Well, it actually is um, like an onboard GPS system for your morals, for your value system. And uh, so that's, very quickly, that's what a superego is. It's your morals, it's your value system, it gives you your sense of right and wrong, what to avoid, what to move towards, that's gonna to be painful, that's gonna be pleasurable, avoid that, do this, okay? And it sends messages down to the superego like, a, like a, a navigation system. You know, please turn left in 100 yards. And then you go, what the hell is a yard? I don't know what that means. And then you miss your turning. So it's the onboard navigation system. These messages that say, please turn left and go north, the duh, is the, these are called injunctions, injunctions. So the superego sends messages down, not literally, it's not, it's not geographical, there's, there's no physical thing in you. Um, it's an idea, it's a model. Uh, it's from Freudian psychoanalysis that I think is useful. And it tells you what to do and where to go. Okay, this is actually, when we talk about the inner critic, the voice inside your head that's saying negative things, we call the inner critic, we call um, the, the negative self, whatever you like, right? So there's a voice inside of your head that's saying, you're useless, you're no good, you can't do this. That's actually a broken GPS system. That's a broken, malfunctioning superego. And the injunctions it's sending down that's supposed to take you to the Liverpool docks are now sending you to some other dreadful place, like Bebbington. Um, and that's not where you want to go. Why is it doing that and what's happening there? So, superego, GPS for morals, values, uh, cultural rules, religious rules, so on and so forth, sent down as injunctions. And these are instructions. Do this, do that, turn left, turn right. Don't hang out with that person, hang out with that person. Yes? The inner critic is the same thing, but we're using different words. And the voice of the inner critic that's saying mean things is a GPS system that is instead of saying, turn left, turn right, you'll be arriving at Liverpool docks in 200 meters, actually starts saying, you can't drive. You're going to crash. You can't drive because you have no spatial awareness, just like your father. You're useless, just like him, and you'll fail, just like it. So, so it's, instead of giving you messages that are supposed to take you somewhere, it actually is just giving you negative messaging. These are called injunctions. An inner critic is a GPS system that is toxified through trauma and is a malfunctioning superego that's no longer sending you positive messages for where you're supposed to go, just negative crap. Let's talk for a moment about what the superego uh, should be and how it functions in your life and why it gets damaged and what we can do to fix it, which is what the Heal the Superego course is all about. And then we're gonna relate this to narcissistically abusive relationships. I just wrote a book recently um, it needs to be butchered by, I mean, uh, rewritten um, and brushed up by the editors. Jokes, fam, they won't butcher it. They'll do a great job. Um, it's that I, I went with the same publishers as the ones who wrote Dave Goggins' book, uh, Can't Hurt Me, because I couldn't decipher whether Goggins' book was like a motivational or a biography or a memoir. And it seemed to be exactly the same percentage of each that I wanted for mine. So that's why I went with them. And they're, they're, they're good people. So... 
I wrote in this book that uh, I wanted an ultra simple way of describing the superego. So I called it the other people part, the other people part. Here is my iPhone cover. It's a very ugly generic iPhone cover. Um, when you are a child, imagine this is a recording device. It kind of looks like the monolith from uh, 2001, The Space Odyssey, right? just goes with the operatic music behind it that makes you go, oh my God, what is that thing? When you're a child, people tell you stuff. The members of your tribe will say to you, don't eat that berry, you'll die. You can eat this fish, it's tasty. Um, this is how we uh, attract a member of the opposite sex. Uh, there is the shaman, he's gonna tell you that we came from the stars and what our purpose on life is, so on and so forth. So you're receiving information and it goes into the recording device that I'm calling the other people part. So here we pretend we have a part of our brain that's very active and open when we're children that is called the other people part. And it's a series of recordings that came from class other people, that's right. When you were a child, when you were a child, the other people part is very on, very open, and it's just sucking up data, sucking up data. So if you're ever around small children, if you ever had uh, um, that experience of looking after very small children, like I do sometimes with my nephews in America, I notice when they're playing, uh, moving in the world, things happen, they find a thing, they see a thing, they fall down and hurt their knee, and they frequently turn and look at me. They turn and they look at me. No matter what it is, they're having a pleasurable experience, a new experience or a painful experience and they turn and look at me. Why are they turning and looking at me? They need me to tell them what that means because they can't assign meaning to anything yet. They will be able to in time, but for now they're riding the bicycle with the stabilizers on and they turn and look at the adults to ascertain what is good and bad. Like children are the ultimate moral relativists. They really have no sense. Of, of, of good or bad, and that's what they need us for. In looking to me, they're actually waiting for data. It's like the computer goes, waiting for data. I just found this pink flower. Can I eat it? Can I screw it up and shove it inside of my snotty nose? What, 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 do, I, what, what do I do with this pink flower? Can I touch it? I'm gonna try and touch it. Does the adult, what's the adult? He's saying, okay. He's making, ah, noises. Or he's going, no. Don't touch, no, don't touch that. So I'm a child, there's a flower, you're the child now, we all pretend we'll all join this group hallucination together. There will be drugs handed out afterwards, you lucky things, and then the groups, no. Um, so I'm looking, you're looking, we're hallucinating, meaning we're imagining together, we're a small child. So smaller, as you stood up straight, you'd be smaller than an adult's knee. You'd be shorter than an adult's knee height. So you look at the flower, you look at the bee, you look at the thing, the soil on the floor, because you're close to the floor, and you have to look up. And you say, what does it mean? And you do this over and over again, and this is you building the superego. This is you filling the other data part, the, uh, sorry, the, the other data part, Freudian slip, the other people part with data. The other people part is getting filled with data. This is good, this is bad, that is right, that is wrong, don't do that, do do this. These become values, these become morals. This is your moral or value system imposed down from on high. It's the internal um, sort of judgmental, um, I suppose it's kind of like a micro, a, a God, but a, a, a singular God, a micromanaging singular God, just your own personal one that's just talking to you or goddess, mother and father combined. The other people part soaks up information and replays it. This is not intelligence. This is not intelligence. This is not even artificial intelligence. It's just a recording device. You can talk to it, but it's kind of slightly dumber than Siri. It's slightly dumber than, than Alexa. It's a part of the computer that is just a server it is just a slave. It just holds data and recordings, but it will play those recordings automatically because that's what we're evolved to do. So as you walk through the savannah and you're walking around and you're 
uh, you're looking for an animal to uh, hunt and to kill. And you're walking along and you see a certain type of holes in that dusty area of the floor over there and you think I'll go over there. When the superego is functioning, it will play recordings for you that are pertinent to your survival in the most primitive, in the more primitive evolutionary sense. No, that's where those poisonous snakes are. You don't go over there. You don't do that. Like, like a parent to a child. Don't put your fingers in the electric socket. Stop it. Don't do that. That's where the snakes are. Those holes are not just holes. There's meaning to those holes. Is there meaning to holes? I'm still a child. I'm a child adult wandering in the world. I have no sense of meaning. No, there's meaning to those holes. They mean poisonous snakes. Who does that for you? The superego that functions should be doing that for you. It should play a recording. It should play an injunction. The injunction, um, an injunction is a, is, a, is a rather pompous word for, it's kind of like an order. Like if I offer you an injunction, it's not a polite invitation. Would you mind just doing this? It's like you, sh thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt not. These are injunctions. I'm really demanding that you obey me. So when it functions well, it takes us away from danger and towards calories, shelter, mating, pleasure, the propagation of life. Narcissistically abusive relationships. So, right, let me just sum up and then we move into narcissism and how this is relevant. You had an other people part that was a recording device in your childhood. You soaked up information and data from the authority figures in your environment. When you're a child, anybody taller than you is an authority figure. Anyone. You have no sense. Like, you're not like, don't listen to our tuk tuk. He's, a, he's always on the fucking fermented pears. He's pissed out of his brains half the time. You don't know that. He's just bigger than you and he's an adult and he's powerful. So you listen to him. So you get bad injunctions mixed in there. But overall, it works. It's a system that's been working as long as we've been evolving as conscious uh, uh, homo sapiens with the capacity for memory and the capacity for imagination. That's how long the superego has probably been around. So the other people part is soaking up the data so that once it's got hold of the data on this server, it's going to play recordings. This cluster of recordings, this cloud of data that's playing the recordings, we call, or it is called in psychoanalytic theory, the superego. When we're talking CPTSD recovery, we say the toxic inner critic. Oh, sorry, the inner critic is what it's called. Of course, it's toxic because the word critic is there. It's the inner critic. But an inner critic is a more accessible way of saying you have a toxified, trauma-based superego, cloud of data, bad recording device. How would that have happened? And how does this relate to narcissistic abuse? If you were raised in an environment where you were ignored or you were told that you were useless or instead of being told things that would help you to survive and thrive, you were told things that would shame you and guilt you. If you were sexually abused, if you were physically tormented, all of these things, this thing is still running. It doesn't switch off. It soaks up all that data and it assumes blindly because it's dumb. It's a server. It's a slave. It's not intelligent. This is important, please remember what I'm saying. This superego data is just a series of recordings. It is not intelligent. So when we're talking about dealing with superego injunctions and battling the superego, you're not negotiating with an intelligent entity that can change its rules. That's not why you battle the superego. You battle the superego so that your personal ego draws a boundary between who you are, your thoughts, beliefs, and feelings, and the negativity of a toxic superego. So, when you're raised in an environment where you're ignored, that communicates to you you're worthless and unlovable. This will create tremendous feelings of despair, depression, anxiety, probably rage in a child, and this is a good environment in which to create psychopaths. If you're told that you're God's gift to the world, that you're special, that you're meaningful, that you were born under a special star, that you're magical, that you're destined for great things and you're gonna change the consciousness of humanity. 
whilst simultaneously feeling like your parents are only really telling you this so they can hold you up so that they receive the applause of the tribe, this is a good way of inducing, you know it, narcissistic personality disorder. So the other people part is listening whether the messages are good or bad and the other people part will do its job because it's dumb. It, it's not going to sit there and go, oh no, mother, that's not a good message. I won't replay that again. It goes, you, adult, message, got message, what me do message, me replay, me replay, me replay. It's really dumb. It's just a server uh, in the sense that um, I'm, I'm not great with computers, but I'm pretty sure a server, oh, I don't know about servers. Imagine it's a hard drive. It just holds recordings, your favorite TV shows, your favorite songs. You can, maybe there is some selectivity as to when the superego can select the recordings, but it can't create a recording. And it, it doesn't know how to delete a recording. So whilst it has some intelligent elements, it might be like, oh, I'll play this recording now because it seems appropriate and this other one later because it seems appropriate to the new scenario. It's not an intelligent being. It's just a hard drive. It's just a server. It's just a slave. It just does as it's told. So it becomes toxic when you receive toxic messages. When you get into a relationship with a narcissist, particularly if you were raised in an environment where you were receiving negative information from the people in your environment, and you may not have been beaten, you may not have been spat on or had cigarettes put out on you, but if you're shamed, if you're guilted, if you're humiliated, if the adults in your environment are using very caustic adult levels of sarcasm with you that you don't grasp, you just feel invalidated, you feel inhuman, um, this is really gonna hurt you, it's really gonna mess you up. And it's gonna create a series of recordings in the cloud, uh, the data is stored here, goes into the cloud and then it plays in the cloud. Uh, uh, it, it, sorry, the cloud then sends down the recordings as injunctions to your ego and you hear it as a voice or you may hear it, feel it as feelings, but that's a subject for, for another day because that really is just a, just a hypothesis of mine. Everything I've said so far, most psychology lecturers would be like, Ugh, that's not how I would say it, that's kind of weird, but yes, something like that is, is, what, is what this is. Um, it's not wild, I'm not saying anything wild or reckless, it, my style is unusual, but actually the raw data here, none of this is mine, this is just the way it is. Oh, the other people part is mine. Um, the idea that the superego doesn't just send down injunctions, but that sends down emotional flashbacks in the traumatized to control them, that's a hypothesis of mine, but I'll do that on a different video. So if you were raised in a negative environment with, with, with people who told you nasty things and it can extend out into school, teachers, people at school being bullied, so on and so forth, and you get with somebody who has narcissism, they will inflame every single one of those old wounds and they will actually, one of the most um, pernicious, nastiest and hardest to heal elements of this is they will trigger a cascading series of emotional flashbacks in you and they'll trigger a cascading series of negative injunctions from the superego within you. So it's not just that the narcissist, the NPD, says mean things because when you go and tell your therapist that or you tell your mates that, they'll be like, well, tell him to fuck off then if he's being mean to you or she's being mean to you. But it's not just that the NPD adult is saying that to adult Richard or adult you. It's that that context that they create triggers in us, the recipient, a cascading series of negative injunctions from superego. So if you're in a critic, isn't that strong? It's not really that bad. You kind of have one, but it's not that bad. The contact with the NPD will make it a hundred times worse. If you actually don't really have an inner critic because um, you were raised in a good enough environment and your superego functions the way it should, you know, the way this thing should, according to its evolutionary purpose, it keeps you away from snakes and it moves you towards delicious berries and it keeps you surviving and thriving. Prolonged contact with the NPD will toxify your superego. Why? Why? Because this thing is activated in adulthood by intimacy. 
stay with me. This probably is not an easy video. So, if, um, so I said to you, you're a child, this thing is taking on information from any adult. If they're taller than you and they can throw a rock further than you, they're a god, you listen to them when you're a child. This slows down in your early teens and by the time you're into your late teens, it's, it's, it's really gone. That's why you rebel. You start rebelling, you're like, no, these adults are actually idiots, they're drunks, they're drug addicts, they lie, they're shagging each other. You know, the tribal shaman actually is like a doofus and you know, that, that's a phase you go through. That is uh, um, in psychoanalytic theory, uh, should be a phase of uh, individuation. So you're actually, it's an element of you growing up. You're, you're, you're no longer um, one fused, subsumed by your parents and their drives and the culture and the tribal drives. You're pulling away, you know, 15 or 16, you grow your hair, paint your fingernails, you put it over your eye, you listen to Nine Inch Nails and you go, you don't understand me, mom. Rebellion, and you pull away. Once that's passed and you're initiated as a young tribal member, which wouldn't be 16, it would probably be more like 12 or 13 for most tribes, usually with something painful and scarifying. Wonder why they did that. Um, and so you move past just blindly accepting authority and putting it straight to the hard drive Nobody else can get to you like that again, except when intimacy is involved. So let's draw an imaginary circle on the screen and you're in the middle of it. You're a single cell, you're the nucleus at the middle of a single cell. And you have people who are tribal members. You have people you work with, you have people you go to the gym with, then slightly closer you have friends and then slightly closer you have family, your parents, they can still get to you. Then you, beyond that, you have lovers, therapists, and priests. These are the people that, these are the people who have the privilege and the power that there are things you've only told these people. You haven't even told your parents. You haven't even told your brothers and sisters. You've only told the priest, the shaman, the therapist, or the lover. This is a, this, so this, this now, like, so friends, the tribe, the church, family, you know, coming in a little bit more, then to parents, and then this, these special relationships, priest, shaman, lover, therapist. Um, this is why we have um, the issue of transference between the therapist and the client. The client develops really wacky feelings towards the therapist. I, I, I've, I've had it when I was in therapy. And I was like, oh, this is, I told her, I was like, oh, I had this dream about you. It was dubba da boa. And she said, oh, this is normal. Don't worry about it. It's called transference. And the reason is because we're discussing things here that are very intimate and at a symbolic metaphysical level, you're becoming naked. You know, there's a vulnerability here. You're naked, you're unarmored, your, your mask is off, the armor is off. And here we are, we're, we're discussing these things. It's, it's an extremely intimate process. So once we've gone into the middle of the circle and there's more intimacy, this thing switches back on. You, I, we as human beings, we start to regress. We become more infantile because in the intimate spaces, there is less armor, there is less mask, there is less persona, there's less ego defenses. And we're in this more vulnerable state. And this thing, because we're now regressing in years through this one relationship, two relationships maybe, in every other area of your life, you're fine. You're, you're you. You're just the person you would always be. With one relationship, this thing switches back on. So when the priest says, you are a filthy, filthy sinner, or the shaman says, you lost your soul connection with Gaia and you failed her and it's because you were ill intent, or the therapist says, you're deeply wounded, you'll never recover, this is you for life, or your lover says, you're deficient, you're a weirdo, you're a lunatic, da da da, so on and so forth. This thing switches back on and it gets into the superego. So what happens? Negative message from intimate person, intimate and in object relations theory, I think they would be objects. So the intimate object has given you a negative message. 
you're then going to internalize that and it's going to become these are called interjects. I feel so clever right now because I remember the right word. Because I don't usually, because I, I, I was a bouncer for a number of years and I boxed and I got punched in the head a lot. And it's maybe a bit thick. <laughs> I used to like boxing. You get punched in the head with these big heavy gloves and you don't remember stuff so well in that. So as far as psychoanalytic theory goes, what the data that I'm receiving from myself from other people um, over time about who I am, my social standing, my value as an object, as a, as a whether I'm a good object, a bad object, a lovable object, a, a vile object, a poisonous object. These are called, oh, I've lost that. Oh no, I interject, introjects. These are internalized. The closer the person is to you, so as you come closer to me in intimacy, your value of your introject goes through the roof. This is as far as I'm aware, that's my hypothesis. Everything else I said is psychoanalytic theory standard. I think that's my hypothesis. I'd be surprised if somebody else hadn't said that as well. So as you get more intimate, you're standing in my, so if, as, like say if you, you watched a hundred hours of uh, Richard Grant's YouTube channel and then, and then you, you speak to me, you speak to me over the phone, or you speak to me over Skype and I'm like, you're a terrible human being that would have more impact on you than if some random came up to you at a bus stop and went, you're a terrible human being. You would ignore that. But for me, because there's a level of intimacy and you put me at a level of hierarchy inside your head, it would be more powerful. Make sense? In, a relation, in any intimate relationship, not necessarily with somebody with NPD, this, this is what happens. The closer they are, the more powerful the interject is. Once that interject that's powerful has come through, it goes into the other people part, the recording device, and then it gets uploaded to the cloud. And then it's stupidly, non-intelligently replayed again and again as a recording, which is called, what's it called class? An injunction. It's a superego injunction. And if it's negative, it's just gonna play again and again and again, because the, the dumb other people part, the server that feeds the data to the superego assumes that anything that comes from an intimate partner because they are now a high authority because I'm infantilized and my boundaries are down, what they said has value. So in a relationship with somebody with MPD, you will over time develop what we call, or what I, uh, what it is called, I don't know who called it, toxic superego, it's a toxified superego, also known as an inner critic. But we're, we're upscaling a little bit by saying a toxic superego. We're actually going back to the psychoanalytic theory and we're approaching it with just a shade more nuance, not much, but I feel it's a shade more nuance that might give you that extra foothold to just make a bit more progress in your healing. So the Heal the Superego course is there to say, wow, okay, you probably had possibly in childhood some superego injunctions, some interjects that you received that became internalized, the superego injunctions, they're now playing out stupidly as recordings. I say stupidly, it's stupid. Remember I said it's a dummy. It just plays recordings. That's all it can do. You're not arguing with an intelligent entity when it says you're a worthless piece of shit, which people with CPTSD and borderline personality disorder, they hear uh, superego in injunctions like that all the time. It's not because it's actually made an assessment of your latest piece of work and then gone, oh, this is about something you've done currently. I want you to remember that whenever you hear a negative superego injunction, the voice of the inner critic, it's only a dumb recording from the past. It's never about now. It's incapable of being about now. It doesn't know what now is. It's not intelligent. It's not even artificially intelligent and halfway sort of taking on data. Not at all. It's a dummy. It's a server. It plays recordings. So you don't have to listen to it. In fact, you must battle it. It's going to be your biggest battle in recovering from narcissistic abuse. And if you're recovering from childhood trauma and CPTSD, the biggest battle will not be the emotional flashbacks. It will be between you and the superego. If you feel like your relationship with a narcissist has given you some rather negative superego injunctions, I highly recommend the Heal the Superego course. Um, powerful piece of work. It gets very, very strong feedback from people. People really love it. And it will clear out some of these uh, negative superego injunctions. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you enjoyed that. Thank you very much for your time and for your attention. 
and I will be speaking to you all again very, very soon. Thanks.